Each month, we'll invite a national thought leader to join us and share the work they're doing to support all types of entrepreneurship in local economies. Um, the goal really is to explore these new ideas and use them as inspiration for policies and programs that we can implement here in Tucson, uh, both through Startup Tucson and through all of your own organizations, and then as individuals and as entrepreneurs. Uh, so for those of you that don't know, Startup Tucson is a nonprofit here in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, we're an economic development organization, and our focus is really to support um, entrepreneurs and startups as they get their ideas up and off the ground. We do this through educational programming, mentorship, networking opportunities, programs like this. We serve approximately 3,000 entrepreneurs a year. Uh, my name is Liz Pocock, and I'm the CEO of Startup Tucson. Um, I have a background in law and have been with the organization since 2016. Um, a few things. So to, the way that today's session will work. Um, Dre will introduce our topic and our speaker, um, and then Professor Mossberger will present the results of her study. After she's done, Dre and I will facilitate some of our team's questions to her, uh, and then we'll turn it over to you to ask some audience questions. We ask that you type your question into the chat, and then we'll call on you, um, and you can unmute yourself to actually ask Karen the question directly. Um, in the meantime, we encourage you if you feel comfortable to leave your video on um, so that we can see your interactions throughout uh, the, the presentation um, so that Karen's not speaking to an empty room, Zoom room. Um, so we encourage you to do that if you feel comfortable um, and please just mute your mic and otherwise I will turn it over to Dre to introduce herself and our speaker. All right. Hello. Um, hi, everybody. I am so excited for this series. You have no idea. Um, so if you don't know me, my name is Dre Thompson. I'm the Executive VP of Startup Tucson. Um, and I am actually coming up to next week, my second year anniversary at Startup Tucson. So very exciting. Um, Okay, so I wanted to give a little bit of background about this topic and why we think it's super important for Tucson to be um, thinking about this and having these discussions. And then I am just super jazzed to um, introduce you guys to uh, Professor Karen Mossberger and the study that she's just done. Um, okay, so what we're going to talk about today. So we are, this is all based off as a study uh, that uh, Professor Mossberger and her colleagues did called Measuring Digital Entrepreneurship at the Grassroots. What's really exciting about this is um, Professor Mossberger has for a long time studied the, the role of um, inclusion, technology, and community development, economic development, um, and kind of how they all intersect. And what, what the, she and her colleagues noticed after doing a large study of um, of different online businesses, noticed that there was a lot of nuance and a lot of micro entrepreneurship wasn't being fully um, captured. And um, so they, through a collaboration with GoDaddy, the world's largest uh, registrar of domain, domain names, um, they explored how uh, they, how these, all these small entrepreneurs and micro businesses really mattered for economic opportunity within communities. Um, and so, what was especially interesting was that they had an effect of creating resiliency during um, economic crisis. So this is just really timely for what we're talking about right now. Um, so I will let her talk a little bit more about that topic, but I did want to introduce her. So um, Professor Karen Mossberger is the Frank and June Saxon Professor at the School of Public Affairs at Arizona State University. Um, she's the director of the Center of Technology, Data and, and Society. Her research interests include digital inequality, digital participation, digital government, local government, um, and really the impacts of technology use. She's the author or co-author of five books, including Digital Cities, The Internet, Geography and Opportunity, Digital Citizenship, The Internet, Participation in Society. Um, and her research has been funded by the National Science Foundation, the MacArthur Foundation, among others. She has been honored with awards from the American Political Science Association, American Society for Public Administration. Um, and so we're just really, really excited. How she came across our, um, how, how she kind of came onto our radar was her work was featured in a New York Times article where they were talking about micro entrepreneurship um, so I, I you know hunted her down read this study I reached out to her and I was like I'm so excited about this study that you did and she is just gracious enough to um, come and chat with us today so um, with that I want to kind of pass over the reins uh, to Karen Mossberger thanks Dre that was actually a really good introduction overall of what this study is that will help me go through this 
you know, more quickly. Um, a nice introduction and, and thank you. And I didn't realize I was the first in this series. Thank you. It's an honor to be invited here and to be able to talk to people who are really living this, who are doing this work in their communities. Um, I used to work for the city of Detroit and um, did work on local economic development and workforce development, which is how I started asking some of these questions. So it's, it's great to talk to people who are really trying to make this change, not only for themselves, but their communities and, and to um, make these contributions. So I just want to acknowledge Carolyn Tolbert, my colleague from the University of Iowa, who's been a co-author on a lot of this work that we've done over the years, and um, Scott Lacombe, who's one of her PhD students who just got a job at Dartmouth, uh, but he's a co-author on this study. Um, so, we approach, we have been concerned for a while about how technology is changing the economic landscape. Um, we know that it's increased the premium for education and skill. It's increased the need for human capital in communities. At the, and at the same time, it's really concentrated economic activity in, uh, in places in a way that we didn't quite see in the manufacturing economy. Um, it's, it's created what one economist, Enrico Moretti, has called ecosystems of innovation or brain hubs. There are these tech hubs or the superstar cities along the coast, as Brookings has, has named them, um, you know, Silicon Valley, places like New York that just won the Amazon headquarters, well, and turned it down, or like Washington. So there are these big tech hubs where activity has increasingly been concentrated and other places have fallen behind. This isn't just from the last recession, but it's a process that's been happening for a few decades now. And so there's been a lot about the winner take all economy and what this has meant for opportunity. Um, we know, for example, that the places that um, children grow up from Raj Chetty's work matter for lifelong opportunity for earnings over a lifetime. So these differences across places and the greater inequality that we're seeing can have long-term consequences. Um, but we wondered whether this was the whole story about what technology um, was doing, about the role that it plays in the economy. We wondered about whether there are areas of the digital economy that have gotten less attention but still have a real impact on communities. Were there ways that technology use could support more inclusive strategies for growth and for economic opportunity for everyone, um, not just the most highly educated, not just people who are in tech firms. Um, and recently with the current crisis, this has led us to some questions I'll talk about at the end about how technology uses affecting local economies during this pandemic and what impact it might have on recovery and future trends. Um, so public policy assumes that things like the digital divide are an issue or how people use technology is an issue, not just for them as individuals, but it's a concern for public policy because it has the potential to have what's called spillover benefits for communities. In other words, to benefit local economic development as well as um, opportunity for individuals. And so we know for individuals, we have better data on how individuals use technology. And we know it matters for things like wages, for the kinds of jobs that people get, for getting middle skilled jobs, even if people don't have a high school, uh, don't have a college education rather. So we have better evidence on this in research, but we haven't had really good measures of how technology gets actually used in communities. So it's been hard to see how 
technology use matters for community development. What we do have that suggests that technology does matter is IT employment matters for um, income in communities for these economic outcomes. But that doesn't really capture the effects of technology outside of these IT firms. There are some studies where broadband infrastructure gets introduced into areas and we can see some economic benefits from that. But we also know that that's not enough to measure just infrastructure because not everyone can afford broadband or not everybody has the skills to use it. There is some government data that's only just recently come out um, from the American Community Survey that tells us, you know, for cities and census tracts for counties, the percentage of the population that has broadband subscriptions that gets us closer to use to actual adoption. But that really doesn't tell us exactly how people are using broadband. And that's what we haven't been able to measure. Um, so um, after having seen some of our previous work on digital citizenship and how technology matters for civic engagement, for economic opportunity, GoDaddy approached us and offered to share their data with us, um, asking whether we would like to partner with them and take a look at this data and see what it could tell us about um, impacts in communities. So for us, this was a great opportunity to have an, a measure of how people are actually using technology, um, uh, the skills that people have around technology. It's, it's a form of human capital in communities. So the data, this maps um, ventures, uh, the density of ventures or the number of ventures per 100 people in the population. It maps it by counties in the US. We have it by zip codes. We have uh, some data on metropolitan areas, and micropolitan areas. I'm going to focus on counties here, though, um, which are white paper uh, focused on. So there are 20 million ventures in the US. Um, uh, the non-technical uh, definition that GoDaddy uses is that a venture is a business, a nonprofit, a cause, or an idea that one of their customers is working on. A bit more technically, it's the domain name website. That's what GoDaddy sells. Um, these are only active websites. Sometimes people buy them and just park them. We're not counting that. So these are active websites and we were able to get the zip code of the venture owner so that we could tie them to, um, to communities. And these include, um, you'll see there are different levels of activity. This also includes data on the services, whether they have social media attached, email and, and other things. Um, so as I said, it's only active websites. We don't have any information about the owners. It's de-identified. The data scientists at um, GoDaddy give us this by zip code, and, and then we've aggregated it and looked at it, analyzed it more. Um, the key thing is what we're measuring here is the density of ventures per 100 population. Um, and so by looking at numbers, actually, we're not looking at income, but by looking at numbers, of course, you're counting um, uh, how much it matters that there are a lot of little businesses. And uh, I'll talk about this more. Um, this led us to discover uh, that we were really getting at some things that aren't in the small business data. So if you're interested in taking a look at the paper or taking a look at um, some of the data, GoDaddy has made uh, public a lot of the data that we've used and it's on this website and you can go in and take a look at it, explore, including looking at data for Tucson and how Tucson compares to other metropolitan areas. So I mentioned that there are different levels of activity and we, um, uh, the GoDaddy uh, data scientists looked at demand and connectivity and breadth, you know, the traffic to the website, how many services it had, how it was networked to others, 
on the internet. And so we were able to categorize um, the ventures. They clustered them in these four groups and about two thirds of them fall in the low, uh, lower, uh, the lower two categories. Um, we talk here a little bit about highly active um, ventures, and those are in the top two categories. Um, they're about a third of the ventures. Okay, so um, using machine learning to categorize this, um, GoDaddy found that most of these were commercial. We uh, worked with them to do a random sample survey to find out more about the customers. And um, according to that, it's similar to what they found in their categorization. 75% um, of ventures are in fact businesses, are commercials. And, um, and we found out that about 31% have no employees, they're solo entrepreneurs. Only about 7% of these ventures have 11 or more employees. So these, a lot of these are very small businesses um, considering that um, the SBA often defines um, small businesses in different ways, but anybody with less than 500 employees or less than 100 or less than 10, these are quite small, many of them numerically at least. Um, about 19% of the businesses are online only, so most have both online and offline businesses. Um, about 20% of them are owned by people who are either part-time workers or are not employed right now. They're retired, they might be disabled, they might be students, stay-at-home parents. Um, so that was an interesting finding from the survey. And while these include big businesses too, obviously multinational firms have their own websites because we're counting numbers that really helped us to capture these very small micro businesses because there are more of them. And that's what we emphasize in this analysis. This is just a map showing by zip code places in the country that are in blue have more ventures than small businesses. Um, looking at the um, government small business data, the places that are in red have more small businesses. So we could see that ventures were, there's some overlap, um, but that ventures, uh, the overlap is in orange, but ventures were representing something different that didn't get counted in the regular government small business data, which is in red. So, you know, also given the survey, we were fairly confident that what we were picking up were these micro businesses that are under the radar and don't get counted. So we looked at how this affects economic opportunity in communities. And there are three outcomes that we looked at economic prosperity, I'll talk about how we defined that in a minute, median income and recovery from the last recession. So we used an index, there's um, the Economic Innovation Group, Think Tank has uh, what they call the Distressed Communities Index. And it has several measures that we thought was appealing because it measures outcomes for businesses and also for residents. It looks, uh, the index they use includes um, educational attainment, housing vacancy, poverty rates, um, percentage of the population in the workforce, median household income, number of jobs, number of business establishments. Um, they have used this at the zip code and county level, but um, since we wanted to see how this mattered for prosperity, we flipped their index so that a higher score means greater prosperity. Um, but we used their measures. Um, so I'm not going to go in the weeds on this. For those of you who've had some statistics, we used what's called multivariate regression. In other words, we look at how this density of ventures in a community matters for the prosperity index, for these scores in prosperity, when we control for other factors like broadband subscriptions in the community, um, demographics, age, um, you know, especially millennials, educational attainment, 
um, the kinds of industries in the local economy, all of those affect economic outcomes like prosperity. So we want to control for those and what, what effect does ventures have when we do control for that. And if you look at the graphs here on the right, the message is just that they do matter. So um, there's a positive and statistically significant relationship, even when we control for these other things, broadband subscriptions matter for the prosperity index too in communities, but even controlling for that ventures matter more. And that's true. The graph on the left is for all ventures, it matters even more if you look a little bit more, even if, uh, if you just look at the highly active ventures, but for all ventures, as the number of ventures in a community increases, we see um, greater scores on the prosperity index. We see more prosperity. And so we did something that's called a two-stage regression model. What that means is that we're, it's a stronger test of whether ventures are actually causing the results we see. So in the first stage, we take out or we control for things like broadband subscriptions, household income, and small business density because we think this might affect you know, whether ventures form. So even controlling for this, this stronger test, we actually see that the effect increases, that the, um, you know, effects are stronger with these additional controls. So that increases our confidence that it's actually ventures that are affecting these outcomes that we see, these greater scores on the prosperity index. And one thing that was really interesting is we looked at um, counties by um, low, medium, and high levels of broadband subscriptions in the community. You have to have some level of broadband uh, subscriptions or broadband adoption or else this won't work at all doing this online. But even in places that were relatively lower, if you look at this blue uh, line on the bottom, how that one goes up uh, at a steeper curve, these are um, play, uh, counties with lower rates of broadband use. They're more rural, they're more poor, but as you add ventures in these lower broadband communities, it has a bigger effect. It matters more in places that are most disadvantaged. And we think that it's really filling a need in these places where there might not be a lot of brick and mortar businesses or where um, small entrepreneurs are able to connect through the internet with markets outside their area. So we can see it matters more even in places that are, are poorer and more disadvantaged. Um, we looked at how this mattered for median income, and it's important to look at change because this gives us a way to measure, are we just picking up that places that are richer, you know, when you add ventures, um, they do better. Uh, we can see that, you know, change over time, it's not just the places that were doing better in the first uh, instance. We can see that uh, looking at change in median household income from 2016 to 2017, uh, adding each highly active venture increased uh, household income by $331 on average, which is actually quite a bit from one venture. Um, it increased even more in 2018, but again, this just helps us to be confident that ventures are actually having this effect that we see, that they're part of the cause of this effect that we see. Um, uh, the Economic Innovation Group had a measure of change between 2007 and 2016. That was their measure of how well places recovered from the recession. And we were able to see that those places that had more active ventures, a higher density of ventures, did better in economic recovery from the last recession. Broadband matters too, uh, but again, controlling for all these other factors 
having more ventures meant that these counties were more resilient. The places in blue are, in darker blue are the places that recovered um, more fully, recovered better the last time. And it was actually counties with at least 2.5 ventures per 100 people um, that saw this positive economic change. So that leads us to especially that last finding about recovery from the last recession. That leads us to a lot of questions that we want to explore. We're continuing to get data, including monthly data that we have now. And we want to look at how this matters for recovery from COVID-19. Um, we know that small firms and micro businesses are really on the front lines and are the ones that are suffering disproportionately. Um, we hope though that this will be one way that uh, they can recover. Um, we wonder whether communities with a high density of venture may weather the storm better, whether they may recover more afterward. Um, with so much moving online, businesses with online transactions may have been able to have continued more during the pandemic. They might be able to market better afterward. Um, and for new startups um, that want to start anew after this, uh, venture, uh, you know, having a website is a way that people can get started with their idea. Um, without having to necessarily rent a space right away or maybe not having very much capital in the beginning. Perhaps this makes businesses more nimble. Um, and uh, again, you know, uh, will this replicate what we found from the last recovery? So we want to look at some of the questions we're going to look at will be um, what effects do we see during and after the shutdown with, uh, with monthly data, we'll be able to see changes in density of ventures and levels of activity. Um, how does recovery from the last recession affect what happens now? Um, is this different in metropolitan areas or less sparsely populated or more sparsely populated areas, small towns? How does this matter considering different economies with different industries? Some industries like tourism obviously have been hit hard. Um, and you know, with all the differences in state policies, we'll be able to look at how ventures mattered in different kinds of states with different environments. Um, so we think that there's a lot that we can learn from ventures because government data really doesn't capture these micro businesses. They've been under the radar. And now we have some data where we can look at these new startups that don't get uh, measured, um, as well as these very small businesses and what impact they have on communities. Um, it's a way to look at online participation beyond just IT employment or, or broadband, the traditional measures that we've had. Um, and we can see that these are significant predictors for community prosperity, that they're important for local economies and for public policy. Um, it's a more inclusive path to growth compared to just competing for the next Amazon headquarters, communities are still going to do that. It's, it's hard to step down from that kind of competition, but I think the message is that they really need to pay attention to how to develop um, talent and, uh, and ideas and innovation from within in communities and not this kind of um, digital version of smokestack chasing. I'm from Detroit, I saw a lot of this in prior eras. Um, and we really think we can learn a lot by tracing this digital activity at the grassroots during and after the pandemic, and that this will help us to understand what can make communities more resilient in urban and rural communities, in the heartland and on the coasts, in all different kinds of communities. And so thank you um, for giving me a chance to talk about this research. And I hope to have a good discussion with you and learn from you too.
Oh, that was great, Karen. Thank you so much. Um, I really feel like you did an excellent job. It's a lot of uh, really maybe dense data, but really explaining how the study was put together and all of the, the different factors that you controlled for. Um, I felt like it was, it was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much for taking the time to share that with us. Um, so like Dre said, um, go ahead and drop your comments in the group chat. Um, and then after we ask a few questions of our own, we'll um, turn it over and call on um, the audience to ask some questions for Professor Mossberger. Um, so my first question, um, Karen, is in the New York Times article that highlighted the study, um, Marcella Escobari from uh, the Brookings Institute was mm -hmm. quoted saying, these small web businesses can be an important buffer for individuals and local communities facing economic challenges. Um, and you touched on it a little bit as, as part of what's gonna happen in the second part of the study, but are there any preliminary factors that you're seeing about these businesses and these micro ventures that makes them so important to resiliency of a community after something like a recession or COVID-19? Um, so, this is, um, so what I showed uh, about the, um, well, this is in the past, uh, the more rural communities, the places with lower broadband, this actually matters more when it's harder to have um, activity. So these are places that may not have large markets nearby and they're able to connect outside of their local community and into market goods and services. Um, I think with the pandemic, you know, people weren't able to conduct face-to-face -face business. And while, you know, to take just as a, um, a common example, takeout didn't really replace you know having lots of people eating as well as taking getting takeout in restaurants still it was kind of a lifeline so people could survive and could maintain some activity and some income during this period e-commerce for you know boutiques or places that could sell things online still it it meant that there was still some income coming in and I think, um, so I've done some work in the past. Um, I evaluated uh, some broadband and digital inclusion programs in Chicago where community organizations were doing work around um, technology use and that included working with small businesses to help them um, develop websites for neighborhood businesses. And you know you can see in in many communities that people have these kinds of side businesses. This interesting finding that we had that a lot of these micro businesses, the um, uh, the ventures, are actually bringing in supplemental income or their part time endeavors. Um, this is often how people have survived and and it's been an important buffer even before this so you know i think that um because this is such a resource for resilience including in low-income urban neighborhoods in rural areas that just as it always has been these small businesses now that are digitally enabled and that have this new connection um, you know, just as small businesses and micro businesses have always existed on the side and have been um, kind of a, a survival strategy for people, I, I think that's going to be important even now. Um, but it, it also will mean that people can get back up and running more quickly, I think, too. That's what we're predicting. Um, we're looking at some of the data and right now, of course, because there's a lag, we're just seeing the decline, but it looks like some of, um, it looks like um, the declines may be less in places with more adventures. We're not sure yet. We're just starting to look at that. That's great. And then you told us that, so now moving forward with the study, you guys are getting the data every month. And yes. so the, yeah. That's it's great. still, um, and the government data, there's a lag on, um, we're looking at some things like um, 
how this uh, matters for employment, um, uh, for different economic outcomes. Some of the government data will take us a while mm -hmm. to get this because there's a lag. It comes out a month you know, month by month, and it's a month behind, but we'll be able to look over time at these trends and, um, you know, where the shocks were, but what happened afterward and how this differs across communities, urban and rural, but places with different economies, with different industry profiles. Um, uh, and, you know, we would expect that there are certain industries that rely more on online commerce, you know, small businesses, that maybe ventures will matter more there. We have lots of questions. Yeah. Not too many answers yet. Um, I'm actually, I had, a, um, I'm glad that you mentioned this kind of side hustle topic, because that was something that really stood out to me. Um, so a lot of the uh, ventures that you studied were considered side hustles and not the primary source of income and you noted that they provided this financial buffer for the families um, that were actually participating in this. Um, this was really interesting because this is kind of sometimes called, uh, or my generation is sometimes called the side hustle generation um, and they talk about stagnated wages paired with rising costs and that sort of has led to people you know, needing to get creative and create multiple revenue streams for themselves, um, even more so in economic crisis. Um, so, so do you think that, you know, given your long research in inequality as well, do you think that side hustles ultimately improve equality and access to upward mobility? Or should we just focus on increasing wages, reducing costs for housing, and then we don't need all these side hustles? What is your, what is your thought on that? Um, I think we need to do both. So, um, you know, uh, it, it's always, people have always been entrepreneurial about um, survival. Um, but I think there's a difference in whether um, you're starting something new because of an interesting idea or something that might be promising for the future. Um, versus whether you're just um, trying to make income. And so actually some of the, the stagnant wages, um, the fact that a lot of people don't, that health insurance is tied to uh, jobs, um, that there isn't, a, you know, um, that wages haven't recovered, that's often meant that people just have to do what they can to make money and maybe aren't able to really try out a creative new idea. We need room for people to try out ideas, to try new things, to innovate, to be creative. And uh, websites and small businesses and micro businesses, the combination, this digital entrepreneurship is a way that people can try out new ideas, but you can imagine that they have more choices about what they can do or what they can pursue if they're not so worried about just having enough to live on from day to day. So I think the two actually go together, that people need a living wage and some economic security, and that in fact gives them more room to try things and to innovate. And that's what we need in an economy. We need innovation to keep growing. That's really the heart of economic growth. Thank you so much. Um, okay, we were gonna do a couple more questions from Liz and I, but some of these uh, questions that the community is asking are just so good. <laughs> we're gonna switch to that portion. Um, and just to let you know, one of the first questions was, was the white paper available? Will the slides be available, the presentation? So just to let you know, the recording of this will be available. I have dropped a link for the white paper with all the data in, in the chat. So if you're looking for that, that will all be available. Okay. Um, Okay, so the first question uh, uh, I really wanted to get to was uh, Christy Street. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask the question? Hi, friends. Um, thank you, Karen. This is really interesting topic, um, an interesting data source, um, especially since it's uh, headquartered and it was founded right up the road from us, uh, the, the GoDaddy folks. Um, 
uh, are well known to us um, for better or for worse. I, I know they've, they've got changed ownership, but some of us actually work with Bob in the day. So um, cool, the approach you've taken to this. My question was really about the, um, we've actually seen kind of, uh, a, Tucson has made the map and some of the, um, some of the recent data has suggested that, that the fastest recovery will be in places where there is more rural space. And we know that there are federal broadband initiatives to actually lay the plumbing to get, um, you know, to, to have the government pay for better broadband in those rural spaces, those, those um, places with lots of land that ha have typically been the flight places um, where, where young people have left and gravitated to the city. So we may see a reversal in that. Do you feel like that there are, is any federal, um, uh, initiative or federal um, uh, interest in creating programs to put onto that plumbing, to put onto that infrastructure, to actually launch those ventures uh, again? Are there are there dollars to incent organizations to help launch these, which would probably be the main hustle yes. <laughs> when when you're out in the boonies. So what I've seen for the legislation that's being introduced, it, it looks like there is going to be some uh, legislation, at least that comes up, that supports broadband infrastructure and some for digital inclusion programs and training, you know, how it actually passes or what part of that get support in the end. I, I think that there will be some investment in broadband and training. Um, it's, you know, been pretty clear in the pandemic how important the internet is. I haven't seen anything that specifically for, um, for use for businesses. And of course, there are strategies about how you market digitally and you know as well as building a website i think that there's room for these more specific programs um, in terms of federal legislation i haven't seen that specifically in the bills that are coming up but i think this is a place where states and local governments that really have been more adaptive and um, have really embraced these questions more. Um, I, I think that there's a role for state and local governments to um, make sure that these kinds of programs are available um, to work with local chambers of commerce or community organizations to, you know, um, to help people to gain the skills that they need to, um, to, you know, engage online uh, in their business, as well as, of course, things like capital and business planning and all of these traditional supports are needed. Um, but there are some new skills for small businesses and micro businesses that are, are needed in this economy. Um, I, and again, I think that at the state and local level, because, um, especially local governments depend so much on local taxes um, that, you know, showing local communities and the same relationships are, you know, the relationships I showed you for counties, those hold for metropolitan areas, that holds for zip codes, which is neighborhoods. I think a message to local governments would be um, that a good strategy would be for them to provide this more specific training and support um, uh, for digital entrepreneurship. Cool. Sounds like uh, Dre and Liz, we need a startup around Tucson as well as startup Tucson. So. <laughs> right. Um. So just kind of following up on that a little bit more, just to, to you've mentioned a, a number of pieces about this, um, but just to be super duper clear, like what, if a, if a city, um, let's say Tucson, for example, uh, really wants to implement some of uh, the things that you found in your foundings, what are the policies that folks could do to um, 
to encourage this type of entrepreneurship? What should they be looking for in terms of um, uh, improving economic development and recovery from the crisis with this particular type of entrepreneur? So I think that there are a couple of levels here. This is actually small business um, and micro business at the intersection of technology use. So in general, um, so that people are able to imagine this and to start these kinds of businesses or ventures, um, we need just more affordable broadband and skills, digital inclusion in the population in general, so, so that there's a pool of skill and human capital um, that communities can draw and that people will come from that pool of residents who have the skills and, and can think about how this could matter for um, creating a business. Um, but then I think there are the more specific programs, um, as I mentioned, um, about, you know, how to build a website, how to market online, um, e-commerce online transactions, security, if you're going to do that, um, social media strategies for marketing your business. There are all these dimensions that, um, you know, are relatively new or that people could use more expertise on um, tips and strategies as well as the kind of small business development strategies that um, is that are often available in communities and those are important too again access to capital and some of these other things are continue to be important but i think that there's room for thinking about the digital skills and how the economy has gone online and um, you know what that can mean for um, businesses and communities yeah thanks Karen that's what I was just thinking that's a lot of a lot of what you're what you mentioned in terms of the skills is really when we launched our Tucson shops Tucson platform is what we were seeing from those entrepreneurs that were previously brick and mortar that the things that they were that they were needing was how do they get their website up? What does e-commerce look like? It's their first time advertising on social media and what courses can they take that really expand those skills and those digital competencies to transition to now, maybe not a forever online only business, but something that's stronger and lives in both marketplaces. So I'm gonna be really curious to watch your data, especially since you track uh, kind of the frequency and like how active a, a company is online to see some of those domains that maybe previously were just a landing page for a restaurant. How much business have they increased? What are they doing now? What can, accounts are they connected with? I think that's going to be really fascinating to see how the online world kind of helps support these small businesses in this kind of unknown time. Um, so I do want to get over to another one of our audience questions. Uh, Sarah, would you like to ask your question on net neutrality? Did we lose Sarah? She said to go ahead and read it for her. So Sarah asks, um, I'm curious if issues with net neutrality have been looked at, or maybe that's something that will be looked into in the future. Infrastructure and access is step one, but I'm curious about how the online micro businesses will be affected by changes in net neutrality and the FCC regulations in the future. So we haven't actually looked at that, but because I work, I do work on digital inclusion more generally, um, you know, one of the issues that's come up is that um, uh, internet providers are able to discriminate on price based on, um, you know, how much traffic. Uh, so obviously, um, this is something that could make internet more expensive for small businesses. We need to be going in the other direction and make it affordable. Many micro businesses, I mentioned, you know, this work by community organizations in Chicago. Um, you know, these are low income neighborhoods where people are starting, trying to start up businesses and, you know, don't have much resources. There are low income communities in rural areas. And this is such um, an opportunity for, for people, for economic mobility and, um, you know, to make 
things more expensive for small businesses and for individuals, um, this is something that's going to affect our ability to innovate. It's going to affect our um, ability to oper offer opportunity for all. So um, obviously net neutrality is an important policy issue that can affect things like affordability. Um, we didn't really look at that directly in, in this study, but it's clearly something that, that matters for this issue. Great, thanks. Uh, Samantha, do you want to ask your question? Sure, I feel like actually quite a few of these points were touched on. Um, I'm Samantha, I'm one of the Startup Women in Tech Fellows for 2020. I really enjoyed this presentation. It's so in line with so much of what Startup Tucson's mission and vision really addresses. So anyway, my question is, have you come across any data that suggests what variables help transition less active microventures to cross over into the higher activity bracket? Um, because we looked at um, basically May 2018 and November 2018 in the report, that white paper. Um, we didn't have a long time period then. Um, we weren't able to capture that. But now that we have a couple years worth of data and we're starting to get it even more frequently monthly, um, I think with tracking what happens now post pandemic, um, that's a good question. That's something we would be able to look at um, because we want to see changes in um, levels of activity uh, and, you know, what predicts those changes. I, the answer to that, the short answer is no, we don't know that yet. But um, I think that we will be able to look at that in the future. And that's a really important question because Obviously, how can people grow their businesses? Micro businesses are great, but they want to become more than micro businesses, right? Um, that's something that uh, we will be able to address in the future. Awesome, thank you, Karen. Um, so thank you all for your questions. I'm gonna ask our final question, and this is gonna be the question that we ask on every episode. Um, since we are talking about stories and innovation stories, um, Karen, can you share with us what your favorite story of an entrepreneurial success is and what you attribute this success to? Okay, so, um, uh, you know, uh, go, you'll see if you look at the GoDaddy website, there are all these really inspiring stories, of people who were laid off and started a business and, um, you know, how that began to grow. Um, all of them are inspiring. But um, I think about one uh, in particular um, that uh, that's here in Arizona. So I work with a colleague, um, Tracy Morris, who is um, the director of the American Indian Policy Institute at ASU. And she's an expert on tribal broadband, but also on entrepreneurship in, um, in tribal communities. And so I, um, she's started an incubator and I've met some of the people from around the country who've gone through her training. Um, but I also was with her doing some interviews in, um, I won't say where, in, in some tribal communities about, um, that, about local economic development. And so we heard that, um, there are some entrepreneurs who are selling traditional foods from traditional agriculture and have actually made a successful business of this, but it really has mattered to the tribal leadership in the whole community because um, these foods that are traditional and sustainable, it's really about the community's culture um, their nation's culture and uh, traditions and being able to um, market these products gets out a message to the wider world and they're marketing this through the internet um, around the country. It says something about the traditions and the agriculture and um, just kind of the community's culture. In, in doing these interviews, people were not just proud, 
that the entrepreneurs were successful, but how they were representing their communities. And actually some of this was really moving. So you could see from this, not only how it mattered for the individuals, but how, how this was important for the whole community to be able to, um, uh, to connect in this way. Yeah, that's a great one. What a perfect story to start off for success. Story. Yeah. Uh, so thank you again so much, Professor Mossberger. Um, Dre is going to tell us all about episode two, so what we can look forward to um, next month. And I just wanted, it was amazing. This was such a great hour, like exceeded expectations. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your research with us and your day.